I am with Change the World Productions. We do yes, social media. I love reading about it. Wow. I think we're live. All right. I know we do know each other. Yeah. Please do. Thank you. All right, you guys ready? Hi. Hey, everybody. How are you? Thanks for coming out today. Uh, so this panel is called Leveraging Content and Celebrity for Cross-Platform Success, Brands and Entertainers Collaborate. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, my name is Josh Stein. I'm special counsel at MG+. I'm also a partner at Basel Street Entertainment. And I'm an attorney by trade. And I make a living building companies. So I work in various media tech companies from film studios, a company called Indomina, the Mikasa Network, I work with Dr. Phil building companies. And so regardless of what the company is, whether it's a product, whether it's a service, whether it's domestic, international, B2B, B2C, the common thread has always been to me, in terms of the big propellant, is knowing what our brand is, knowing who the customer is, and being able to sort of have an interaction there, and being able to drive from there. So with that, I'd like to kind of go to, my, to, go to the panel, introduce everybody. Um, and why we're here today is really to sort of talk about, on the one hand, celebrity and brand, and then on the other hand, customer and audience, and how content is really the sort of connecting factor, and sort of how to build businesses off of that. So with that, I'd like to introduce my panel. So, Ari, kick it off. Sure. Um, my name is Ari Avishai. I work at CAA in the marketing group. That's suffice. All right. Okay. <laughs> so why don't, why don't we do this? Why don't we go, why don't we go, why don't we go down the line, tell us who you are, what you do, and okay. since this is marketing focused, let's talk about what your brand is and maybe who your audience is. Okay, absolutely. So I work at a creative artist agency, uh, as I mentioned, in the marketing group, and we're a marketing services group that sits within CAA, one of the world's largest um, sports entertainment agencies, and we work directly with brands, helping to build, build brands through the power of culture and entertainment, oftentimes leveraging the place that we sit with entertainment, representing some of the greatest content creators, whether those creators are, are writers, directors, actors, athletes, musicians, and beyond and help to um, leverage the, the insights um, and place and relationships that we have to create um, a variety of solutions on behalf of our brands. Sometimes they will take the form of, of content and sometimes many other, other uh, things as well. But in a nutshell, that's what we do. Oh, and um, we work closely with um, General Motors as my day-to-day my -day client. We also represent Coca-Cola, Chipotle, Diageo, and about seven or eight other uh, Major, major brands. That's awesome. Fair. Yeah. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Hi, I'm Justin Hochberg. I run a production company called Just Entertainment, and we create ideas, package them, sell them, and make them for TV. Um, a show on the air right now is called The Profit on CNBC. Uh, you may see lots of billboards all throughout LA. Uh, I got my start, I came from actually marketing and business development at Microsoft many years ago, and the first show I helped develop is very topical today in terms of brand and timing was a show that would soon be called after I got involved with called The Apprentice. So I was, uh, I have all the tapes on me. Anybody would like to hear anything, I'd be happy to play it for you. Uh, today is actually the day out. I am out of my NDA, so I can do that legally without any problem. Stop. That's what we're talking about. Um, in any event, uh, so, and I say that not so that you either hate me or, or think I'm entertaining, but also because uh, back then, my whole career has been building brands with personalities, whether it's Marcus Limonis, who I found as a unknown businessman running RV companies, or even Donald, who was well known to some extent, but I was in charge of developing a lot of the branded entertainment stuff that was involved with that and uh, so I my brand as a creator of shows is big and different um, it cuts across all genres with musical acts um, dating business etc but we always are developing ideas that are big and different um, and you know as an example in the last year we've sold nine brand new shows nine formats that are now going global so um, mm -hmm. it, the defining yourself as a brand even when you're creating ideas and letting people know what they can get from you is a very valuable thing as equally as for this as it is for the clients that CAA represents. I think we're being uh, broadcast. Well, there's live streaming on the web, right? There, there, we, are, we are live. I hope so. Uh, as, okay. Nora, as Nora Efron said, everything is copy and I, and I live by that so I'm glad it's streamed. 
Hi, uh, my name is Evelyn Ouellet. I work at Sephira Entertainment. It's a marketing consulting firm exclusively in the entertainment industry. So we work with companies, with producers and talent to develop their projects, finding the right target audience, the right positioning strategy for them, and um, then making sure this gets to be, to be monetized. So we work with um, several companies like Cirque du Soleil. We do a lot of work for them. We work um, also with a company called Reflector Entertainment. They, um, the owner is the, um, the creator of Assassin's Creed director, sorry, sorry, creative director of Assassin's Creed, so lots of things in TV and gaming. And also, we recently started working with DG Brock, who's here in the, in the room, um, about a VR project, so we're really excited about that. Good afternoon, my name is Devery Holmes, and after being president of a large entertainment marketing agency, went out on my own eight years ago and founded Spark Alliance Marketing. And we specialize in representing brands, content providers, and celebrities, and we develop integrated marketing campaigns. Two years ago, we bought Creative Entertainment Services, a large branded entertainment and product integration business, and i um, excited to be here. Hey guys, how are you? Uh, Jonathan Lowe, um, SVP of Business Development and Brand Strategy for the LA Kings and AEG Sports. Uh, I've been with the company 14 years, been working on the Kings specifically since the 05-06 season. Um, you know, had the, had the privilege of being there for uh, the Stanley Cups and all that fun and, uh, you know, honored to be here and look forward to the conversation today. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Wolf. I served previously at the, the White House producing films for President Obama, so I've become very much a social impact film guy. I now, most of the work that I do now is with um, President Obama's sister, whose name is Maya Sotoro. She's a wonderful individual in her own right. And um, we do a lot of films for various good causes from uh, nonprofit gala films to we're working on an animated series for kids with some writers, producers from The Simpsons and Futurama and kind of everything in between, all centered around some sort of social impact in some way, shape, or form. All right, well, there you go. There's the panel. So, you know, when, whenever I go to these things, everyone always kind of sits around and we talk about what works and why it's been great. That's helpful, I guess, to an extent, but it's also kind of no fun. So I'd like to go down the line and just one by one, I want you to kind of tell me over the last, I don't know, call it a year or so, what didn't work, and what did you do to fix it? Starting with me. Go right ahead, Ari. You first. Something and by, like by the way, yeah. it, it worked. juicy. And mm -hmm. by the way, if you're drawing a blank, we're in an election season, so just feel free to deflect and talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd prefer to be substantive uh, in, in sharing. Um, something that didn't work and what we did to fix it. I, there's been several situations and I'll, um, where in a, a creative idea, um, I always feel that a creative idea is only as good as the partners that you bring in to help uh, create said idea, and equally the, as um, uh, equally innovative and, and specific of a, of a distribution marketing plan behind it. So I think there's been uh, several situations recently where we've, not several, thankfully, but a situation recently where we had some, we had an idea that on paper was fantastic. We got it funded through, uh, through a brand and um, we're forced to work with a uh, particular creative partner, which I'm not going to name the individual, um, but it wasn't the right person for the project. And I think it was more so just a, a lesson of knowing that it doesn't matter how, how great of a story something is or isn't, it's only as good as the partners that you bring in to help you create it. Well, it seems to me it's also that that would be an execution issue and sort of having control over all the links in the chain. Absolutely. Those things, I mean, it all comes down to execution. I'm sure we've all heard versions of that before, um, but there's certain, certain roles that seem to play a um, more important uh, position than others. And uh, if you're not in a position to make all of those, right, th those decisions and you're relying on others, sometimes you keep your, uh, make yourself susceptible to, uh, to a weak link and sometimes it can be the demise of something that would have, would have been great. And How's that for a mildly election or vague yet specific answer? There was, there was, there was a good deflect there. Okay, it's it's acceptable. You're not going to get booted, so that's okay. kind of a good thing. Um, so I would say pretty much most everything I work on fails. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would say that's not just me. Um, it'd be nice if it was just me and that would protect others. But anybody in the content or arts business, 
is in a business of failure, right? So whether you're an artist or a ballerina or a musician or a TV producer that creates from the onset, you're failing most of the time. And I say that, and here's an easy statistic, right? If you think about in a scripted world, there's about 300 scripts bought to pilot, uh, scripts bought in the broadcast network space. 30 of them are made in a pilot, about three plus or minus ever make it to actually becoming second season, which is really sort of the path to recoupment for your investment. Um, okay, so that's at the moment in the most productive content country in the world, 99% failure, right? And that's before forgetting all the other hundreds of thousands of ideas and scripts and one liners that can put. So, so most of what I do is create ideas that never make it to the logical extent, you know, some multiple seasons. And so everything I do, that, so the only thing I could figure out to do to fix problems is just to fail quicker. And that's it, right? Because in a business of failure, the worst thing to do is take a really long time to fail and then realize, ooh, that sucked. So one of the things that content business today is there are a lot of digital purveyors like Netflix or Amazon or Hulu who have a different ethos as to how quickly they move. You know, uh, in TV, I might pitch an idea in January, and if I'm lucky in all success, maybe we're making it by the end of the year, probably about 15 months out. I have a show now that has not been announced for one of the streaming um, uh, premium things. We literally are making the show in eight production days and five weeks total from here's the deal, go make it. Okay, now it's not gonna be any better or worse based on the amount of time that we were given to it, but we're gonna figure out whether it works or not very quickly instead of spending eight months. And so I would simply say in this business, fail as quickly as possible. And it's the same with Silicon Valley, right? Who knows whether you've got the next Uber app or not, but don't spend four years to develop that. Just let the market talk quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like your question. So many, so many failures. I think I'm gonna to choose to share, to share a personal story with you guys um, because I really learned a lot from that. So last summer, um, I was in London with some friends and we're having a discussion. Only adults at the table, so there's like four of us and we're talking. And um, one of my friends there was the CFO of L'Oreal in the UK. So, you know, pretty big job and large, like L'Oreal, all the brands and Lancome, Biotherm and all they're, that They're stuff. nice, they're, you know, healthy so, little startup, yeah. Pretty sure. good bread. So then the kids are playing and they come see us and my 10 year old daughter is there and she goes and she's like, I'm so excited. So we're like, how, how come you're so excited? She's like, woohoo. It's because Zoella, I feel like Zoella, what's going on with Zoella? So we're listening, but kind of halfway listening. And, um, and, and the CFO had mentioned that the week after, they was gonna present uh, to the, the CEO of L'Oreal worldwide, so they were getting ready to, to do those big presentations. And she goes, well, Zoella is launching her cosmetic line. Like, okay, but who, who is Zoella is again? Well, she's got eight million followers, subscribers on YouTube. So we look at our friend there, it's like, we hope, we hope you're aware of that, right? <laughs> and he's like, um, no, but I hope the CMO is aware of that, you know, and, and maybe yes. the chief marketing officer was. So anyways, I've learned, I've learned to be more curious, to listen more, to ask more, to be very, because I come from TV and radio, so more traditional media. And I've, I suddenly became really interested in knowing more about the social influencers and the brands that they put on the market and the co-branding that they do and all the leverage that they have and the, the attention from the, the fans and con the, the consumers. Um, so that was that was my big learning from my vacation last summer. It's, it, it's interesting too because you know, especially in the social sphere, when you're up to eight million followers, I mean, that's a lot of eyeballs in general. But also, at least with social media personalities, it also tends to be a lot more, say, focused than you know, getting eight point five million viewers for let's say a primetime show. So I mean, and and by the way, just, I said, where's Zoella from? She's like, she's from London. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're in the UK. She's from London, and now she's at fourteen point five million followers. Wow, it's a whole new world. So a failure, huh? A failure. Um, it doesn't have to be a failure. It could my also favorite be. favorite recent one is um, we're lucky enough to work with the grannies who developed ice chips candy. Did anyone see them on Shark Tank? All four sharks fought to get this brand that is made out of xylitol. 
So it's the birch tree, it's diabetic approved, it takes plaque off your teeth. Um, it's fabulous. But they got so much press that they did not take the shark's money and decided to do it on their own and we were recommended. So they want to target kids and families, kindergarten to fifth grade, to change behavior, to have kids realize candy can taste good and be good for you. So we thought, how do we position this? They aren't at a place where they can hire a celebrity quite yet, um, but we want to break through. So we worked with Goosebumps, a scholastic title that became a feature film. It was a wonderful campaign. The problem is retailers didn't embrace it. Retailers said, you know, it's good, but off-shelf display and everything that we wanted to accomplish, we got. But the combination of retailers not really supporting it and consumers not really knowing what ice chips candy was yet, didn't quite match up. So we were lucky enough to get approved by Disney and Disney's nutritional standards, which is not easy, probably the biggest success of my career. And we came back with Finding Dory and created wonderful content, educating moms, throughout the nation, and um, now we're getting into new retail accounts like Sprouts, like Whole Foods, and um, we're really excited. So cool. um, you know, coming from the sports world, I think, you know, when you develop a consumer product, you know, when you're marketing or promoting that, you can, you know, test it, and, you know, you sort of have a reasonable, ex you know, expectation of how that product will perform. In sports, you have absolutely no control of your product, which is your team. You know, you could have an eighth-seeded team that wins the Stanley Cup, which we did, or you could have a highly favored team that gets knocked out in the first round of the playoffs, which happened too. So, you know, we face those challenges every day of not being able to control the storyline of our product, not being able to control what happens on the ice, but off the ice, obviously responsible for the health of the business. So. I don't know if that's a failure, but it's sort of a challenge that we face daily. I would say on the flip side, that becomes sort of the exciting part of working in sports is that it's unpredictable and you have to have your plans and you have to prepare for your plans, but at a drop of a hat, you have to be able to adjust to the narrative of the season. And that's also the fun part, I think, of being a fan of sports is that you never know what's going to happen. So, you know, again, not winning the Stanley Cup every year, you know, for our team is certainly something that, that, that crushes them. And we want to win every year, but you're not going to win every year. So how do you make a successful business without being able to, you know, predict or, um, you know, achieve always that major success on the ice? And that's the fun of working in sports. Mark, before you answer, Jonathan, I, quick follow-up to that. So one, you know, one challenge I'd imagine you have to be facing just being working for a team, it's kind of a common challenge in sports is that, you know, people are usually into the athletes and sort of view the team as almost, you know, I think Jerry Seinfeld called it laundry. So, you know, can you maybe talk a little bit, you know, in terms of challenges of getting people to actually, you know, one, you know, care about the LA Kings as opposed to the players, but also to care about I'm a former hockey player, and I'll give, you know, vouch for this firsthand. It's hard to get people to care about hockey in the U.S., so you guys have been sold out for a while. How did, how did that happen? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's funny. So, yes, you know, it, for most sports teams and most organizations in general, usually following, and I'm going to use social media, I guess, as an example here. You're following the social media accounts of an organization is usually not very fun, not very exciting. They're only going to tell you, you know, the, the basic kind of storylines and the stats and everything else that you can already get. And, and I'm not going to brag because I don't do it. It's a guy named Pat Donahue and our, and our digital team, and you can look this up. For our Twitter account, we were really the first team in sports to create a personality and an edgy one and sort of a snarky one where we were willing to make fun of ourselves and willing to make fun of other teams in ways that at the time no sports teams had ever done. It got us in some trouble, um, but it also garnered us a lot of attention, a lot of followers, but we were willing to take a risk. You know, an example is one year we were knocked out of the playoffs and we tweeted to another team that just got knocked out, hey guys, you know, you want to grab a drink. I mean, most sports teams don't tweet at other teams when they've lost in the playoffs, you know. So, again, I encourage you guys to look up what we've done with Twitter. Um, we were named for a couple of years the only professional sports team listed in Sports Illustrated Top 100 Twitter accounts. And it's exactly because most times people want to follow the athletes, the personalities, because they're the ones with the personality that are willing to take a risk. Um, and through our social handles, you know, we created sort of that new paradigm and it, it had some success for us. 
Thank you. So uh, when Josh asked this question about what did you do wrong, I thought, well, where do I begin? And I, there's been so many wrong things that I've done as well. Uh, I think um, uh, I go back to one of my mentors, Chris Lee. He was the president of TriStar Columbia, and he said that what makes the difference between the successful ones and the unsuccessful ones is tenacity, because everyone fails on some level in, so, in many ways, right? Even the successful ones have failed to get to that success. So the ability to get back up and keep going, I think, is one of the determining factors there. For me personally, I can, in the last year, uh, one big one that I thought would easily succeed is um, a series that I've been working on with a very talented team, Obama's sisters producing it. David X. Cohen, co-creator of Futurama, he worked on The Simpsons, Patrick Barone, Simpsons Futurama, Rugrats, um, great team that we had. We put together a pitch, we pitched it around from Netflix to Cartoon Network, seven networks in total, and it was universally rejected by everyone, despite the good team. They all showed some sense of interest, but not in the actual idea that we produced. So what we've done since then is, you know, we sat down and thought about, well, what do we do now? So what we did is we kind of, based on the theme of this panel is we crossed platforms to start and we produced it as what is called an episode so we did our own thing versus TV streaming which we don't have control over whether it is a yes or no we decided to self-produce it raise the funds ourselves put the power in our own hands and create an app based on it which could also because it's an animated series it's an app uh, with a storyline could be reproduced into a TV series and now, so that's one thing we did is we crossed platforms in a sense, we went to app. And the other thing we did is we uh, leveraged some of the connections that we had and the celebrity sense that we had. So we might, this, this is a might and I can't talk too much about it, but we might have President Obama involved and some other celebrities as guest stars that are coming in as well. So we've crossed platforms, we've leveraged celebrity, and now um, the conversation's back on the table with the networks that we originally pitched to and we have our own platform as well that we're working with via an app. So that's, uh, I think, a good one that went from failure to a level of success. So, you know, I, I, as I was sort of reading the giant, uh, the giant title to this panel, you know, I, I saw that it's, you know, the subtitles, you know, brands and entertainers collaborate. You know, and if you kind of read the news, what's going on, you see that there's a really blurry line between the brands and the entertainers. We're actually, you know, the entertainers are becoming, they've kind of been brands themselves and, you know, whatnot, but they're also kind of getting behind the actual companies themselves. They're becoming entrepreneurs. I mean, just this week, you know, there was an article in the journal about Tiger Woods starting a venture fund that he's going to basically put his brand behind. You have Beyonce with watermelon water, and you have, you know, the sort of granddaddy of them all, which is 50 Cent and uh, vitamin water and his big exit there. So, you know, it sort of, it seems to me like the, you know, celebs are, you know, becoming sort of part of the brand, the brand themselves, they're, they're almost merging, you know, whether it's through, you know, more than endorsement, whether it's through sweat equities, whether it's capital. So, you know, I don't know, what do you, what do you guys think of that? I mean, am I, am I crazy? Is there something going on here? What's the reason? Where's it going? Let's just go right down the line. You want me to start? Well, I think for, for the longest time, there was a notion in, in the entertainment space that if you did something with a brand, you were selling out. And the only times that major talent would do something is when they could do it overseas and not have, not have that. And so obviously there's been a lot that's changed across the industry. And one of the major reasons I think we're probably all here, but um, the, the idea of, of, of disruption on all, on all levels um, is, is not um, absent in this as well. And um, I think there's been a, a bridge between brands doing a better job, the ones who do it, who are effective marketers, doing a better job at understanding what it means to be a, um, a person of influence, whether you're a celebrity in the traditional sense or not. And then on the same side, individuals who, who are influencers understanding a bit more um, about what it means to be entrepreneurial and not just um, um, single, single focused in, in their line of work. And so it's, it has created a number of those, and a lot of the ones that you listed are, are the ones that are well-known and expected, and there's many that aren't. Um, I, I wasn't a part of this one, but the, the rapper Nas is, has a venture fund, and he's made some very successful investments recently, and he's someone who you would never have thought of as somebody who's um, minded enough to make the investments that, um, that it is, and I'm, you know, he has good advisors. But um, it opens up the door not just for the investments that you're talking about, but also have an effect on, on content, um, from a from a brand standpoint, 
And I know we've, um, we've been a part of several situations where we, um, on behalf of a brand, have worked with a, an individual, a talent, um, that has an aligned sort of a, a approach to, to the world and what their brand represents and, and what uh, the, the corporate brand represents, and have created um, a couple of situations where the brand would, or are, are able to latch on to what the uh, talent's passion um, points are and help them fulfill something that they weren't able to do otherwise, tell a story that they weren't able to tell, try um, dabble in a field that maybe they haven't, in, um, haven't been a part of yet, and the outcome of it also being effective in building the brand um, who's financing and co-producing, uh, whatever it may be. And I imagine you're, we're gonna see more and more of that um, as the days come. I mean, I've been at, at CA for uh, seven years now, and when, we, when I started there seven years ago, the, the amount of uh, talent that we're interested in having conversations with brands was incredibly limited. Um, it has changed significantly. There's um, a tremendous amount more of, of talent that wants to be in direct conversations, developing ideas, creating content, um, being strategic alongside of some of the, the great, most innovative brands that um, we all know and love. Um, and I, I think the result of that has created, when it's done well, more entertainment for the consumer and more opportunities to build brands on behalf of, on behalf of the brand. Well, you used the, you used the phrase at the very, very top, selling out. And sort of, you know, would you think that when you have, when you actually have talent getting behind the product, whether it's through equity, you know, whether it's that piece more than an endorsement, I mean, it seems, is that what, you know, when they, when they throw around, you know, it's kind of become a buzzword now, authenticity. I mean, is that sort of, you know, proof is in the pudding type stuff? Yeah, I think it's part that, and I think it's part also the, um, our, our society, our consumers are more open to seeing our, um, our favorite celebrities and talent um, aligning themselves with brands. And, of course, being authentic, as you mentioned, is, is important. And, and when that's done at, in the best success, you're, um, you're not going to see, uh, hopefully, a lot of pushback. Um, from yeah, from from consumers, uh, but but I think yeah, that is an incredibly uh, important part of it, and that's where there's a lot of versions of it that hasn't gone well, and um, the, those that that are the best are when it there's alignment between the vision of an individual and a brand, and what they do together is something something great and smart and interesting and, and, and entertaining and um, manifests itself in something that people will seek out on their own and not be uh, interrupted while watching their favorite television show and forced to watch commercials, which is you know, kind of the, the epitome of, of where those selling out um, illustrations would manifest themselves. No? I think that you got a question. And, and I think the word conversation is actually a, a pretty operative word there. I know when I was, absolutely, when I, I know when I was working with Dr. Phil and his organization, they were actually very masterful at just building a community ongoing where there was a two-way conversation. He was one of those folks who just, he knew his demo cold and he engaged them, you know, across all the relevant platforms. And so when the time came to build a business or a new product, it was never push here, buy this. It was always it was always something along the lines of, hey, we're in a conversation right now. I know you have a problem, so I'm listening to you, and here's what I got. So, I mean, you know, Evelyn, I'll go to you, but, you know, who do you think is getting it right, and sort of what's yeah, your sort I, of experience um, on that? I really like your question because I thought about this a lot coming from the more traditional and definitely moving to the new social influencers. And I think this is a very exciting time because we have more possibilities than we've ever had before. So I'll go with examples because sometimes it's kind of easier to understand. So I was looking at Charlize Theron Dior campaign. So this is a celebrity, obviously, and a brand. And it's working really, really well. Last time I checked, 28 million views on the last, uh, last uh, ad that was uh, released. Um, somewhere in the middle, you have like the co-branding. So um, an example for that would be Katy Perry's new um, Kate, Kate, uh, sorry, Kate Cat Eye. So it's eyelashes and product for the eyes by CoverGirl. So you've got her brand that's it's not Katy Perry, so you, you get that it's her, but it's her, her brand and CoverGirl. So that's really like a co-branding. Uh, 
And then I was looking at what Jessica Alba did, and she launched a totally new product line called um, Honest Beauty. It's not her name. It's not a, a brand's name that was there before, like CoverGirl or Dior. So she's launching something really new, and there's all the tutorial on YouTube and all that stuff. So I think the, the more traditional way still works really well, if you do it well. And it's the right strategy, the, the right creative, the values of like the celebrity and the brands together work really well. But there's also the, that new way of doing things, and there's all the spectrum in between that's still possible. So that's why we have to be really strategic, because when launching like a new campaign or a new association, we have, I think we have as professional in the industry to look at all the possibilities and make sure we go with the best one. Well, Evelyn, it's also, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of seems like we're in flux right now where the old's not exactly deprecated at this point and the new is, it's there and it kind of works, but it's kind of new and we haven't quite figured it out yet. So you're, what you're basically saying is, would you, is it accurate to say you, you got to kind of find a way to harmonize and work the two of them together because neither one kind of stands on its own anymore? Um, it's more like find what works for your audience. Where's your audience? Who are you targeting? Where are they? What do they like to hear about? So it's, I think all possibilities are good. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve. And you know, we work with Flo Rida and putting together campaigns for his music videos which is a very different overlay than developing content with brands, and then actually having him star in a brand campaign that he did with Seagram's after they were part of his How I Feel video. Um, you don't want to overexpose your talent. You want to make sure they're authentic, that they find the right fit for their brand, and it gets exciting that people want to work with them. And how do you slow down the process and make sure you're making the best decisions for the long-term vision, not the short-term vision? I think there are three things that actually caused us to be in this spot. Um, maybe not only three things, but three significant drivers were, first of all, uh, there's a thing in Hollywood where typically talent has not wanted to accept anything that wasn't upfront payment because typically those payments were lost through the studio system uh, where it's, you know, we've all heard the stories of residuals that never quite make it even though the m movie made $500 million, right? Those cartoonish gross profits definitions. Right. Yeah. So, so there's been a hesitancy for people to want to take some form of back end, right? Um, so at the same time, about 15, 20 years ago when dot-com boom happened in the late 90s, there became this public consciousness for the first time in America that there, like, basically being in the stock market in the late 90s became like a thing that everybody could do. And it wasn't just for retirees or 401ks. It was like really a thing that you would talk about. People were actually for the first time talking about like stock portfolios, like, as a, like baseball. And so it started to become obvious that this was very accessible and that you started to understand this. And then I think the third factor is that a lot of the, then you started to see entertainment personalities take a risk on getting equity back end, and then when 50 Cent gets it, and everyone sees the story that he made $150 million, instead of taking $5 million to be the face of it, it's like, oh, I now can connect trend one and trend two to a tangible example. And now, the advent of sort of the fourth pillar now is, today, celebrities are their own brands because they have a direct path to anybody through Twitter or whatever social media platform. I mean, you know, the Ronson being a great one. What does he have, 60, 70 million followers? I mean, these are now more powerful marketing machines than every studio he's ever worked with to promote a movie. And so I think when you figure those three things that happened, followed by now a direct channel, it now becomes perfect sense that you'd be a brand and you'd be exposing your life and showing, you know, how you get dressed in the morning or how you work out or any of that stuff. I think the one thing to key on, but, but, but I think your question was also is the dichotomy between like the celeb endorser and the rise of the internet, sort of the voice of the average person or the average sort of expert that then becomes, you know, officially or unofficially involved in shaping a brand or team. And, you know, in sports, you know, at least from my perspective, our fans are our best marketers. You know, their passion and that sort of real organic passion, you know, is, is way more compelling in, in, in promoting a team than anything, you know, the marketing folks could ever think of. So, you know, I, I think with the Kings, I can think of a couple examples where we've recognized organic online communities and supported them and embraced them and allowed them to take a forefront in our official sort of platforms. And one, this is, 
you know, 2010, so this is not really cutting edge technology, but there was a message board. There still is a message board. It's called letsgokings.com. And we wanted to create our own message board, and we tried, and we didn't succeed because all the fans were on this message board that it already existed. It was fan created. All the dialogue was there. So instead of, you know, continuing to try to build our own, we partnered with them and we brought them into our online ecosystem and we supported them and we promoted them as the official message board of the LA Kings. And we didn't censor what they said. And then we started realizing, well, what else can we do for this community? Because again, these are our fans, but they're also a powerful online voice. And these guys, you know, and, and, and women, of course, obviously had been communicating online for many years, but never had a physical place to communicate in person and hang out. So at a time, the ESPN Zone had an open bar space, and they came to us and wanted to develop a, a Kings bar. And we said, well, let's make this the Let's Go Kings bar, which is the, name of the message board. Let's make this their official home where they can meet and hang out in person before the game. And oh yeah, let's make a portion of proceeds from the, from the revenue of that place and the beer go to their charitable cause, not the king's official cause. And oh yeah, let's let them come and sort of like, you know, you go to a, a fancy restaurant, you can have your wine locker with your name on it, let them make custom beer mugs with their logo on it and their online handle. So when they come, they can drink out of these fun beer mugs. So we tried to, to bridge online and offline. And I think that goes to, I think, to your point of, recognizing and embracing influencers online that are your fans or your consumers and how do you capitalize on those folks but not ruin what they created yeah I think that um, I mean I'll talk about President Obama because I think he is a great example of someone who is a celebrity and a brand it's largely one and the same with him right so um, I think that the best and most successful time that he had was at the 2008 campaign in terms of his celebrity and his brand. And what they did so well, what the campaign did so well, is creating a grassroots movement that really was led by the people. There's um, a professor, Marshall Gans, who is from Harvard, who developed the campaign strategy. I would encourage you to look him up if you have a moment. Uh, but he developed a strategy based on the question, what's your story, you being the people? And then based on your story, you would connect to this is my story and this is why I am supporting President Obama or this is why I want change. It was all based around the people and the grassroots movement um, that it started with. I mean, I was one of those and created a little uh, grassroots film that, um, that made its way uh, sort of up the food chain, but it started as just a little grassroots uh, production. And, um, and then a lot of people found a sense of uh, importance from that, a sense of empowerment from being able to uh, do what's based on, on your story and what you feel is right and how you support President Obama and you could do whatever you wanted via Facebook and social media platforms that you could get it out there. So they had a sense of empowerment, they had a sense of belonging and believing and it was very, very timely. Um, so the campaign I think did a great job and then if you look at the, I think it was 70 million to 10 million friends and followers on social media if you compared Obama to Trump. So that really translated uh, into a, a large following which translated into votes and funding for the campaign. So I think uh, President Obama is a great example of that. Yeah. Interesting. You know, I, I you know, actually, if you can kind of expand on that, you kind of glossed over it, but, you know, I think it's sort of informative because, you know, we're pulling back to sort of, you know, 50,000 feet, we're talking about sort of, you know, the audience, you know, and then the sort of brand and celebrity being connected by content. You know, what you did with, you know, what you did with Obama was actually fairly, it was, it was new, it was completely novel, so maybe kind of walk us through a little bit how you got there. Yeah, well, I mean, I, at the time that um, the whole Obama thing happened in 2008, I was um, a student, a film student, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And um, I saw President Obama as something that I was passionate about and that I really believed in. Uh, and I decided to produce a film uh, for the campaign. And it ended up playing at the 2008 Democratic National Convention. And that's how I went on to serve at the White House. So it was just a little grassroots film. Uh, that, uh, that I just felt passionate about, really, that I wanted to do to be involved in the campaign. I felt that sense of importance and belonging and wanted to do something to create a change as well. Um, and I was empowered. It was the right time for it. It was 2008. New media was really just in its cusp and growing and that sort of thing. Uh, so it was a great time. I bet there's people right now that are doing 
some sort of Trump parody film that's going to have some success after this as well. You know, they're taking advantage of the time and uh, the, uh, the, the, the popularity of what's going on right now with him. And so, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great opportunity that I decided to take advantage. There was a celebrity factor. There was a cross-platform factor. There was new media involved. It was empowering. We could do it um, at a very, very grassroots uh, small level. Um, and then I would say a third thing that I saw and took advantage of was that uh, uh, President Obama's brother-in-law worked at the college where I attended at the University of Hawaii. So I saw that as the golden ring in front of me that I decided to grab and take. And I begged and accosted him to do something <laughs> related to the campaign until he finally let me. So I think all those factors helped me personally be able to grow into being able to work at the White House and, do, and produce films there. So when you you know when you're dealing with public figures, it's a little different. You know, we kicked off this leg of the conversation with 50 Cent and sort of taking the back end and owning equity, so you could have a giant exit to Pepsi for you know some piece of 4.2 billion dollars. But you you'd mentioned votes as one form of you know return on investment. But you know what else when you're when you're working in sort of the you know political slash civic space? You know what else would you define as success? Well, I think the campaign's a little bit different. Campaigns are about inspiring people. You want to get people involved and then have them go out and vote. Um, at the White House, it was more about uh, building a sense of transparency, education for the people. We did films. I mean, this was the first president to have a new media account, a YouTube account, and, and that sort of thing. So we did um, a series of films that you know haven't been done before, which was really exciting. We did an Inside the White House where you could get a glimpse of what it's like to be at a cabinet meeting. Uh, and we did the West Wing Week, which was a recap of what the president was doing over the week. So it was keeping people engaged in some way, shape, or form, uh, and, um, a sense of knowledge of what was going on, that education, that transparency, that, and, um, uh, and it was a, a very exciting time. Yeah. So, you know, then going back to the whole 50 cent thing, so there is a giant profit mode of 99.9% .9 of the time. So, you know, the question then becomes, I guess, where are they hiding the money? What's, you know, what's the most profitable? What's the best tool for the job? And you know, th things along that line. What's the most effective? So Justin, what are your th what's your thinking on that? So the question is... So in other words... Tell me the question again. I didn't quite follow. You didn't, no, no, second, no second ask, sorry. Yeah. No, so in terms of... We're talking, so, you know, we're talking about brand yeah. connecting to the audience with content. So obviously, you know, no one, you know, at the end of the day, there's the love of the art, but it's for profit. Sure. So, where, where are they hiding the money? What's the most, in terms of getting projects financed, what's, what's the most effective source? Or, and then sort of on the back end, what, you know, where's the biggest ROI in terms of what's been most successful in sort of your, in your experience? Well, I, I think in terms of how are people getting things funded, especially in new media, the nice thing about today, the math is really in favor of everybody being empowered with the tools that are now publicly available for almost nothing. You know, it used to be, to what you can accomplish today with $5,000, used to cost about $5 million of venture funding in about 1999 in terms of server access to equipment, et cetera, right? So the democratization, which is the rise of the YouTube influencer, that really costs you nothing, this is all you basically need, and everything else is free. So um, that's a good thing, and that, or it seems like it's a good thing. Um, I don't know that anybody's hiding the money, per se. I think that there's lots of money to be made in many different ways. I mean, um, obviously, some of the, any brand, whether it's Dwayne Johnson or you know, Tyler Oakley on, you know, or one of the YouTube personalities, they have, they've figured out a path to monetization. I mean, the CAA has set up a very aggressive group of digital marketers, digital agents to represent these personalities. Uh, on this show I referenced earlier, we have uh, personalities from the YouTube space on our show, and some of them are getting paid as much as traditional big name talent because they command not only performance fees, but they have a built-in marketing platform. Uh, if you took somebody like, I don't know, pick uh, Justin Timberlake, right? He's great, but he doesn't have as big of a marketing platform as some person you've probably never heard of on YouTube. And so when you pay those people, you're actually getting something that you didn't get before, which is talent and distribution. And that's a big difference these days. All right. I think you need to um, also, there's a level of, of recognizing the opportunity and the opportunity. So you ask like, where is the money? What's the problem? There's, there's only there's a pure answer for that. And if you answered it right now, it might change tomorrow and be different if we answered it yesterday. And there's a, there's a couple of examples, one somewhat dated and then one even more recent that I've been 
impressed by people identifying opportunity through kind of the power of celebrity, but one was um, about 10 years ago, uh, Will Ferrell had an idea for a really funny video um, and was about to, and produced it and was about to go put it on YouTube, and before he did, uh, he talked to uh, his, his agents at, at CAA and said, wait, 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 before you post that and give all these impressions to, to YouTube and let Google sell advertising against it, maybe we should explore creating our own um, comedy platform online. And that's essentially what they did. And they brought in investors and created uh, Funny or Die. And it started on the, the heels of one video called The Landlord. And so that was one where Power of Celebrity created this massive revenue uh, but, new company. But should, in retrospect, that may have been the wrong decision because Funny or Die is largely not considered a success in terms of economics. Right. Will Ferrell made a lot of money. Will Ferrell made, but like as an investor, I'm not. I'm not worried about Will. I'm yeah. sure. He, but like, had he put up a YouTube channel, which I understand the desire to own yeah. it, you know, yes, you were giving away a lot of revenue, but it also costs very little to do a lot of that stuff. I mean, so like, you know, there's a lot of people today. The make or rent decision is slightly right. different. I think at the absolutely at the time, and I, I think they would still make it again because the funny or die brand has become what National Lampoon sure. was, you know, t several decades ago, um, with all the shows on HBO and films mm -hmm. and all and all that. So the company right now, what are its operating profits? I, I I don't know, but the the level of creating and owning your own, I think you're constantly going to be faced with that. Bond, you know, rent or uh, or own question, and it's about identifying that opportunity. I think in that situation, I, many would agree they made the right decision. Uh, but are there for every one? Are there dozens of others that that haven't resulted in the creation of Funny or Die? Are there you know tons of attempts at creating the you know either duplications of that or other other versions online? Absolutely. Um, I think that one though, it's about recognizing and having the foresight of what you're creating. And they created a, a media company it's, um, in, in Funny or Die. Uh, so I think, I mean, that's one that I, even though it's a bit dated, I'm, I'm impressed with uh, in terms of, you know, the, answering the question of where's the opportunity, where's the money, how's that, how's that being identified and what's going on. I don't think there's an exact answer. It's more just identifying what your value and equity is and then um, what, the, what an opportunity is and hopefully surrounding yourself with, uh, with good partners to create it. Anybody else want to jump in? No? So in that case, turn it over to the audience. Are there any questions? Yes? Um, do any of you, especially on the CAA side, or you know, dealing with athletes, have any tricks that you guys have used to convince a celebrity or an athlete to socialize for a real hard for a holdout? I mean, obviously, a brand deal. A trick besides money. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was that, it always that, comes down to that. Is that <coughs> yeah. a crisis, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, there's, I think there's different appetites. I don't know, to, to generalize across all celebrity would be a difficult one. I think some are more um, open to sharing intimate details of their life, um, and some are a lot more guarded. Uh, I think there was a moment where every single celebrity a, a few years ago was having a conversation with a social media expert and educating them on platforms and hopefully with the intention of creating an audience and some have done incredible jobs like Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart who are media networks yeah. of them you know of their own and then there's other celebrities that are probably on the same level in terms of of being good at their field and making just as much money from their you know, picture commitments, and um, but have opted out of it, and so I think there's um, there's enough education out there that those that want to be a uh, have a presence in social media and interact with their fans um, are have the know-how to do it, and some revert back and, and don't want and kind of want a, a bit of a separation. I think there's also certain uh, the DNA of certain people industries that lead people to want to do it more. So, for example, uh, obviously a comedian or an athlete there or a, mu a musician are all in the business of standing in front of living human beings and feeling the fan interaction on, in their professional life, whether it's high-fiving at the sport arena or you know fans screaming and yelling on stage. So they're inclined generally 
from my experience, to feel more connected to their fans. You know, there have been fan clubs forever in music, right? So they, those people. Um, I think there are certain actors who they act, you know, on a stage or separate that, you know, not as interested in doing that because it's not as much of their DNA of that experience. Now, everybody's slightly different, but it's not shocking that someone like Dwayne Johnson, who is a live performer at heart from his wrestling days, or Kevin Hart, who's on tour, would be aggressively pursuing something like this. Uh, and there are also people like athletes who are used to getting sponsored by brands, and the more valuable they are in terms of the platform, right? Because you know, Kevin, uh, an NBA player, you know, uh, LeBron doesn't control the NBA or the Cavs. He's got to have his, and he doesn't have a channel. That's his mechanism. So there's certain DNA of the way an industry works that are going to lead people more often than not to those things. And I would say also to echo to your point. I mean, you know, in terms of you know what individual athletes or performers, you know, will and, and won't do, you can't make, you know, through your marketing or promotion, someone into something that they're not. So choose the folks that are engaged and want to be engaged, and how do you maximize that? If there are guys that don't want to participate and just want to focus on what's happening on the ice or the court, then you're not necessarily going to, in my experience, try to convince them to be big media personalities, and that might not be their, you know, best suited for that. So choose the folks that are engaged and are dynamic with that, and how do you amplify that in a positive way. Yes, sir. My question was, uh, did any of you anticipate the curse in this kind of influencer marketing bubble, whether it be from a consumer who says, I know the tail is driving a fiat or a shaft that you fit inside of that viewer, I'm not going to actually buy that product, and to the brand side where I'm like, sure, we've got 28 million views on our DR campaign, but what does that mean for our bottom line? Are you seeing any So you're talking, so just to kind of paraphrase, you're talking about sort of, you know, it, it, will there at some point be a disconnect between the authenticity of whatever the campaign is vis-a-vis -vis its impact on the bottom line? Or just brand of willingness to spend and invest in influencer marketing without seeing results on the uh, bottom line? I think for me, just as a, oh, sorry, just as a consumer, and again, I'm talking from a, you know, a consumer in my own perspective, if I know that that influence, whether they be famous or not, is an expert and loves, has a real passion for that brand, and that's real for me. You know, so as, as a consumer now, I go online, like I like watches, and I go on YouTube videos of people talking about watches and un mm -hmm. unboxing their watches, and they don't have to be a celebrity or not. If they're passionate about that product and knowledgeable, I trust them. And I, you know, and they develop an equity to me as a consumer, and you know, they could, and in some cases, some of those videos have influenced purchases I've made. So I, I think, as a consumer, I see myself gravitating more towards the platforms like YouTube, and you know, where people have a voice to talk about the things they're passionate about. And to me, whether it's a celebrity or not, if they are an expert in my mind and truly passionate about that, I'm going to listen to that, and I'm going to be influenced by that. We were lucky enough to work with Brad Paisley on a craft cheese program. We had to choose the genre, the artist, and the sponsorship package. And Brad was very particular on who he would and wouldn't, would not work with, and he had to really embrace the brand. And we were lucky enough that uh, he loved recipes. And his consumer, country music, loved recipe creation. So he got very involved. He even directed our commercial. He did late night. He wrote parody songs. Um, sometimes you really luck out and get that perfect, <laughs> you know, um, kismet relationship. I, just quickly, I, I really agree with what you just said. And also, John, you, you touched a key word. I think it's trust. Um, and I think everything makes sense when you trust someone. And it was proven, I was reading a research about that that I thought was really interesting. When you watch someone's life or listen to their music or watch their YouTube video or see them on TV as themselves, you feel like you know them. You spend hours and hours with them. So when they come up with a brand and say, hmm, I, again, I trust that brand. So it's like a chain, right? You trust a personality, that personality, celebrity, trust a brand. Well, chances are you're going to at least give it a chance instead of maybe not considering it. So it's always the same two old things. Like, 
awareness and appreciation, but chances are you're going to have more appreciation for a brand if someone you trust is recommending it to you. So it sounds like you're talking about no, as in just pure celebrity for the sake of celebrity, versus trust, as in sort of what John was drawing to, which is, I don't care if they're a celebrity or not, and it's sort of, but I know these, these people know watches, so I'm going to watch them unbox the latest whatever it is. I'd actually be curious, show of hands, who would be driven more to a purchase decision by, who would trust a celebrity more or who would trust more of an expert? So for celebrity, who cares more about that? Audience? Crickets. Wow. (laughs) It all comes back full circle, self-executing prophecy. Then that's a Good point. And that, so, and that happens. The, yeah. And that would be, so, so, so we, I would break Often. down for celebrity for the sake of celebrity and then sort of expert as in whether they be cele- expert or not. Very, 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 very true. Yes. So the question is, we're, we're sort of build, we're building up social media as sort of a genuine interaction, but what you're basically saying is in your experience, it's really just, it, become, it basically becomes push all over again, just in a, you know, same old wine, new bottle. I think it's a bit to the point of the gentleman behind you asked the question of, is there a tipping point? Is there a motion where, because it, the, a couple of years ago, we, you know, we, celebra- we, we would talk about social media. Like there's a way that celebs can dir- interact and communicate directly to. And as a fan, you feel like you're actually interacting. And I think we're starting to reach that, reach that tipping point as it relates to, to brands. The, uh, for his question, they're becoming more, at least in my experience, more uh, savvy to recognize that. We used to measure engagement. And so it wasn't just how many fans Dwayne Johnson had. Of course, that's important that one someone will have X million fans. But then you know, the next thing became engagement and measuring of those you know, uh, millions of fans, how many people like and read post and interact. And it's even taken it a step further. There was a situation recently where um, a client of ours was considering a relationship, probably similar to the ones that you have with, with brands, with a, with a well-known pop star who's got 35 million um, followers. And on paper, 35 million followers and then a, a, a tremendous um, engagement rate in terms of you know, every post that she did had six figures or higher likes and 50,000 comments on there. And so they were selling on the heels of that. But as we started to do the diligence of looking into the engagements, even when she posted for her like, uh, for her sponsored, uh, sponsored posts, all of the comments, the, the amount of the comment of the 50,000 that had anything to do with that post were incredibly limited. It was all just, she would, she, whether she posted her new music video or this particular brand, everything was, I love you, I love you, I love what you're wearing, and had nothing to do with what she was trying to either promote, whether that was her own um, promotion of, her, of, of something for herself or a brand that she was getting paid for. And so I think there is a bit of a tipping point coming, and it'll, as brands get a bit more savvy and as consumers get a bit more savvy, there will be another level of it, but just measuring based on number of followers doesn't work anymore. Measuring based on, um, on, on, on how interactive people are uh, also is starting to be less valuable. I think also being mindful of the audience, because I do believe that people join social networks to connect with the brands or products or teams they love and connect with each other. So while you know, everyone or, you know, or, or some people are trying to monetize those platforms, I still think the ones that are doing a really good job at it are still rel- you know, 
uh, recognize and cognizant that there are people on the other end of, the, of those communications. And if you're replying to people and engaging in dialogue as opposed to just posting and thinking about, am I being value-centric in what I'm you know, distributing in terms of the content or the messaging, that I really do think that there are still vibrant communities out there that are really trying to connect to the teams, the brand, the products, the shows they love. So um, while I think people recognize they are being marketed to at times, I think there's a real community behind these that still exists. Great. Any other questions? Oh. Yeah. Yes. So the influence you're asking about the influence of media on social media. For social, on move, on for social, move, on social movements. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think about uh, Colin Kaepernick was is the the guy who sat down or kneeled down during the national anthem. I think it's it's working because I see it on other people, friends posting it on Facebook and then I think that kind of connects to your question as well about uh, when it feels genuine and honest it's coming from an individual from a friend that is posting it on a platform in support of it then I think it is uh, impacting it and it does have a that grassroots sort of feel that that it's coming from your heart and it's from a place of honesty and uh, and being genuine is so when when your friends are posting it online and I'm sure that you can look at analytics and numbers, and like the White House would would do that extensively. In the oh, I'm, I'm probably someone is, is doing that. Yeah, I'm sure that 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 that's out there. That someone's doing that. Um, and then, for example, like the campaigns that we would do, we would extensively keep track of that. So we would do a lot of analytics to back it up. Uh, I mean, I can just tell you, I think it is. Yeah, because I I see my friends posting it, and I think that on a, on. A, you know, innate level, you feel it. You, your friends are posting it, and that, that's making a difference uh, in you. So, I mean, I think that, that that goes back to this larger campaign, which we, you know, we have our final debate tonight. It hasn't felt as inspiring, I think, to a lot of people because it feels more kind of corporate in a sense, and there's so much fighting back and forth. Whereas, going back to the 2008 Obama campaign, your friends were posting about it, and there was a sense of um, honesty and genuine, real emotion behind it. That the most I worked on several political campaigns, the ones that have been successful, there's a lot of friends posting pictures of themselves wearing a shirt or out campaigning, and it just feels real. It just feels very, very genuine. And when you have a lot of your individual friends, that spreads. If we all were to post something here and there, or just a, a section of you, right, that expands that sort of web, that social media web that you want to have, and it, does, and it feels, feels more real. Absolutely, yeah. I, I can't comment on that issue specifically, but I know that, for example, campaigns keep track of that extensively. We would get, for example, a every start of the month uh, at the White House New Media Department, there was an individual who just focused on analytics. That was their job. And at the start of the month, they would give statistics on where we're going, uh, in terms of number of views, number of hits, number of uh, how long everyone is on uh, this particular video or this particular page or this particular issue that they're talking about. Um, so it, it was quantifiable in a sense. And based on that, we would, that would impact our strategy moving forward. Yeah. All right, we got, we got time for literally one more. Then I know, I know at least one of us has to make a run. So. Um, Gentlemen, all the way in Sorry. the back. <laughs> oh, John, Jonathan's got to go. Sorry. So, uh,
created a positive environment. A super fan that celebrity, Eric Stone Street, honored you guys, combining all these things together, making the social media impact with such a great force. Is it this important for celebrity and the media and the social media can come together and give that impact and awareness? Yeah, well, well first of all, thank you for for, for being a fan and, and recognizing that. And I think that's, that's the perfect storm where it, where it all comes together in an amazing way. Um, and I think you see a lot of organizations, you know, r really having cause-related initiatives at the core of, of, their, of their business and, the, and their purpose in LA. So obviously we've been here 50 years and we celebrated our 50 years and we're spending most, or, uh, you know, a significant amount of our time this year with our Forever 50 program giving back to the city of LA. And you know, social media uh, enables us to tell that story, not in a self-congratulatory way of looking at all the great things the Kings are doing, but we want to tell the story of how the Kings are giving back and how our fans are involved in that and the lives we're touching through partnerships like CHLA. And those, those avenues give us the opportunity to, to tell that story and also recognize the people that we're touching when the players visit the hospital, <clears throat> you know, those are, moments that you can't replicate and the players look forward to that you know and again it's not always about the monetary contribution which we do it's about that human connection um, so you know thank you for being aware of that and that's really at the heart of, of what we're trying to do you know with our with our foundation our we are all kings marketing campaign which we featured fans you know as the the focus of our advertising campaigns and the fans and the players are equal it's not the players up here and and the fans down below and and when you have the opportunity and the privilege of having you know celebs and being in LA you know we're spoiled as a sports team of, of celebs that come to our games and our true Kings fans we want to amplify their their voices and um, you know again they can say it better I think than we ever can so thank you for that it's a good way for me to end thank you <laughs> Great segue. Everybody, thank you for coming out today. Thanks to the panelists. Enjoy the rest of the uh, conference.